Thank you for joining us in worship today. Welcome. It is so good to worship the Lord together. I pray that as we gather together today that you experience the Lord, worship Him in spirit and truth, both through song and the preaching of His Word. I'm especially excited about our current uh, walk through the book of Revelation. This is a wonderful book of God's Word in which we find comfort for the day, but also a reminder to know that uh, Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, that He is in control, and that we want to live our lives faithfully following Him. We are indeed going to go on a worship journey as we explore Revelation chapter 4 this morning, talking about the holiness of a worthy God. Let's stand as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let's sing together. Holy, holy, holy. this morning. 
First Baptist Church, it is so good to gather in the Lord's presence and to know today that He is worthy of worship. Can't we agree on that today and lift up our voices to Him and uh, give Him the praise and honor and glory that He so deserves. Thank you for being here this morning. We are so glad that you are here and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us as we meet with Him today, but also as we uh, desire and long to hear a word from him today. If you're visiting with us, thank you for being here. would love to know of your presence here today, so if you would fill out that visitor card on the pew back in front of you and drop it in one of the offering plates when they come by a little later in our service, we would love to connect with you this week and uh, know how we might minister to you or, and or pray uh, with you and for you. And so uh, it is good to be together in the Lord's house this morning. I want to share... Uh, from Psalm 99 this morning, verses 1 uh, through 3, which says, The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Our Father, we bow before your throne of mercy and grace, Lord, and we so agree with the psalmist that, Lord, as we gather here today in this place to meet with you, Lord, uh, we do long for your presence and we do know that you are high and exalted, far above and beyond us. Lord, you are sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords. And Lord, there's nothing more that we need today in this hour than to meet with you to uh, worship you out of glad and, and joyful hearts, uh, Lord, uh, for who you are and what you've done. And Lord, uh, to hear from you today, to know that you have a word for us. And Lord, we need it, we desire it, and Lord, uh, we want to hear you, we want to submit to you. And we want to leave out of this room today walking in submission to you as our Lord and our Savior. And so Lord, have your way in our hearts and in our lives. Meet with us now. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
just say the words if you don't know the tune. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. 
Amen. Amen. This morning we turn our attention to Revelation chapter 4. We, ca- we come to a new uh, section in our study of Revelation, a new, turning a, a new page as to what John sees and what John is speaking to us. Uh, we have finished the letters to the seven churches last week and we saw throughout those letters to those seven churches a time of um, just... Uh, great word that we, no matter the church in any age, needs to hear, needs to understand. Uh, It's a word for all of us. It was letters to seven specific churches, specific times, uh, but it's a word for the church at large above all time. And so may we take to heart what we find in the letters to those seven churches. But this morning when we come to uh, chapter 4, we begin a whole new journey in the letter of Revelation. In fact, John says in verse 1, after these things I looked and behold, and he begins to tell us what we're going to read in just a moment. But what John is saying there is uh, it's a new perspective, a new vision, not a, not a new vision apart from what he's already gotten, but a new uh, chapter of the, the vision that God, that God has given John. And uh, what John is going to see now will take us through Uh, chapter 22 of Revelation. And so we saw, you remember when we looked at chapter 1, John said he was going to receive a word from the Lord of the things uh, which are and which will be. Well, we finish the things which are, the easiest way to put it. Uh, When we finish the seven churches John saw in that time and place, those are the things which are, the things that are going on among the church in the church age. But when we start chapter 4, John is speaking to us about the things that are to come. And so may we put our minds in that uh, perspective as we begin to read what we find in chapter 4 forward. In fact, today's word in in Revelation 4 is going to be 
about a little visit to heaven that John gets. Have you ever wondered uh, what it would be like just to take a trip to heaven, maybe, and see what things are going to be like, or uh, maybe you uh, would like a trip to heaven to uh, visit loved ones that have passed on and you miss. Uh, but you know, in reality, if we were to take a trip to heaven, we would never want to come back. That's the reality of heaven. You know, I, I tell people oftentimes at funerals to give comfort for the loved ones who uh, have known the Lord, that even if your loved ones could come back for a visit, they wouldn't. Not because they don't love you, but because heaven is just too great. And the presence of God is just too great. And so instead of longing to come back to earth, they're longing for you and me to get there and uh, experience all of the joy and wonderful aspects of heaven that our minds cannot imagine we can't visit heaven and come back we wouldn't want to there have been those who have claimed to have had a little visit to heaven and near-death experiences and have written bestseller books about it and i'm always skeptical of that because uh, paul had a visit to heaven and he wasn't allowed to talk about it john had a visit to heaven and john was commanded to write about it and what John writes is much different than what you will read in these modern day books of those who claim to have gone to heaven and come back. Uh, but what we always want to hear is not what somebody else to ha has to say about heaven, but what does God have to say about heaven? And we find that in Revelation 4, uh, in beginning in verse 1, we're going to see John's visit to heaven and what it tells us about the nature of heaven and our longing to be there. Look with me, beginning in verse 1, we're going to read through the end of the chapter. And he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the, son of a, uh, the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on a throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and sardis in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, <coughs> Worthy are you, O Lord, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. <clears throat> For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. What is John telling us about heaven that we need to take to heart this morning? Well, first of all, heaven is a place of divine authority. Heaven is indeed a place of divine authority. I've already told you in verse 1 that John says, after these things, meaning this is a change in John's uh, chronology of happenings. John got a vision of the seven churches, and after that seventh church, John, uh, John's vision changed. And so he's saying, after my vision of the seven churches, then I looked, and uh, John gets a view into heaven. A door standing open in heaven, and like the first voice, he says, which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place 
after these things. And so two times in verse 1, we read the phrase, after these things. The first one is John's chronology. The second one is God's chronology. John is saying, after he saw these things, then this is what he saw next. And then God says to John, come up here, John, and I'm going to show you the things which will take place after uh, the things that you've just seen, which are the things that are happening right now in your life. And as we've said, in the church age, uh, um, from now until Jesus comes back. And what did John, uh, when he got this vision, what did he see? Well, he looks into heaven and he, see, he first hears the sound, or he sees the door standing open, the door into heaven, and he can see through that door. And more is going to happen as he looks through that door. But then he hears a sound. And this sound John has already heard before in chapter 1, and it is the mighty voice of God. And let me tell you, every time God speaks, it is a voice of authority. How does John hear this voice? Well, he hears it like a trumpet. A trumpet because it is a sound that, that gets your attention. It is a sound of authority. It is a commanding sound. When God speaks, people listen. And when God speaks, you know it. Now, God speaks to us today through the Word of God. And God is always going to confirm anything that He is leading you to do by His written Word. That is the authoritative, inerrant, sufficient Word of God. What John hears from God is the commanding voice by which God, through human authors, penned His Holy Word. And God says to John, come up here and I'm going to show you the things which are yet to take place. And so in verse 2, John says, immediately I was in the Spirit. Now, this is not some mystic um, experience that John has as if he's having a dream and he gets a view into heaven. John is taken in the Spirit into heaven to see what God is about to do and what God is going to speak to him. And you say, well, why can't that happen today? Well, remember, John is, is charged with writing a book of the Bible. The canon has not been closed, clothed, closed at this point. John is one of those divine authors that God is using to pen his holy, uh, his holy and errant sufficient word. And so what John gets at this point is God taking him in the spirit into the throne room of heaven. What a wonderful, uh, all expiring experience this must have been. He says, come up here. I will show you these things. And then John says, well, as I was in the Spirit, a throne was standing in heaven, and the one sitting on the throne, uh, and one sitting on the throne. And then in verse 3, he begins to tell us what he was like. But what John sees, first of all, is the throne of God. He hears the voice of God. He sees the open door. Then he sees the throne of God. The throne is standing in heaven because it is fixed. It is not going anywhere. That is important. That John noted for us that he saw a throne standing in heaven. Don't miss over that. Because what that means for us today is that the throne of God has always been exactly where it is today. Don't miss that. Things in this world are chaotic. Things in John's world was chaotic. John was on the island of Patmos. Why? Because he was being exiled because of his faithfulness to the witness and the word of God. It ended him in exile, and God used that time of persecution to give John the most holy experience of his life. And part of that experience is John sees with his own eyes the throne of God standing in heaven. And it is the eternal throne of God where it's always been. And let me tell you today where it is today and where it always will be. The throne of God is going nowhere. It doesn't matter who is the president of the United States. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And he always will be. I don't say that to diminish the importance of a national election or your right to vote. You need to. You must. But first and foremost, our allegiance is to the King of kings and Lord of lords. And his throne is in heaven. More importantly, though, he sees one sitting on the throne. Verse 3, And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and sardis in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. What John begins to describe as the one on the throne who we know as God is full radiance. It is divine glory. It's like a pure diamond. It's the picture of God's magnificent presence. 
that God is holy, he's righteous, and nobody can compare to God. What John sees on the throne of God is unlike anything he has ever seen before as he looks into the presence of God. God is full of authority, and his pre- not only does his voice command it, does his place command it, but his appearance commands it. Isn't that wonderful? The voice of God commands authority, the place of God commands authority, and the presence of God commands authority. You see, heaven is a place of divine authority. God alone is God. If we believe that to be true about heaven, then we must believe it to be true about our life today. If you are a follower of Christ longing for heaven, longing to get to where Jesus is, longing to be with those loved ones who have gone on before you, longing to see what John is seeing, then you must live your life today and every day God gives you on this earth submissive to the authority of God, knowing that there is nobody else who is going to overtake that authority in my life. Nobody can tell me not to bow the knee to King Jesus because I'm going to bow the knee to Jesus because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And one day, every knee will bow to him. Let me promise you that. Paul said it in Philippians, the day's coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess uh, that he is King and he is Lord. Now, there are a lot of people today not bowing the knee and not confessing the name of Jesus, but they will one day. They will one day, and sadly, for many on that day, it will be too late. It's not too late for those who live their life now bowing the knee and confessing His Lordship. But you got to live with Him as Lord, not just Savior. Because heaven is a place of divine authority. And so John see, hears the voice of authority. He sees the place of authority. He sees God's presence of authority. But look at verse 4. This is interesting. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting. The throne is standing. The elders are sitting. And what are they clothed in? White garments. And golden crowns are on their head. Victor crowns. Who in the world are these 24 elders? As with much in the book of Revelation, there's been a lot of theological debate over who these beings are. Some say they're angelic beings, but uh, I don't believe that to be true because uh, angels are never said to be clothed in these white garments that uh, are related to humans. Angels are not often uh, uh, detailed that way, nor are they told to have golden crowns on their heads. It doesn't fit the entirety of the biblical narrative. I believe these 24 elders are indeed human beings, human representatives here. When you say, well, who are they? Well, some have said they represent the nation of Israel. But uh, given the way we interpret the book of Revelation in context, the nation of Israel as a whole has has not yet experienced that time of salvation and in the tribulation hasn't happened yet. So I don't believe this is representative of Israel. Some say this is the tribulation saints that made it through the tribulation. Well, if we believe in the rapture, the rapture hasn't happened yet. Uh, or, or excuse me, if we believe in uh, the tribulation, uh, if we believe in the rapture and the tribulation, the tribulation hasn't happened yet. We're about to get there, but the tribulation hasn't happened yet, though the rapture has at this point. Some say it's a combination of Israel and the church. Twelve. 12 uh, representing Israel and 12 representing the church. But that, that could be, but every time the Israel or, or the church is mentioned, it's never divided like that. Never one number with two, uh, the half and half being divided like that. You say, well, who in the world are these 24 elders? Well, I'm going to tell you who I think they are. I told you last week after we ended the seventh church that I believe um, that uh, I believe in um, The fact that the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation, your theology might differ from that, and that's okay. Uh, We may never know till the time happens or till we get to heaven, but that's my theology of the book of Revelation. I believe the church is going to be raptured uh, pre-tribulation. I believe there will be those who will be saved during the time of tribulation, though it's going to be very difficult. You, you, You and I know how bad the world is today, but think about how bad the world's going to be if we believe in the the rapture when there is no presence of Christianity whatsoever on the planet. There's no salt and light. It's going to be so hard. So don't think 
if Jesus comes back and I'm not saved, I can get saved in the tribulation. Well, it's possible, but it's going to be extremely, extremely difficult. But if we believe in the rapture, I believe these 24 elders represent the rapture church. It's interesting, isn't it? 24 is the number of complete, often represents a number of completion. And so that's why we have the number 24. Elders always in the Bible represent human beings. So I think it's beyond discussion that this, whoever it is, refers to human beings. So we have a complete number. We have human beings. But look at what they're clothed in. These 24 elders are clothed in white garments. What did Jesus say about his church? What did we read in the seven churches? That for those who overcome. Didn't Jesus say, I will give you white garments? Take away your sin stain and I will give you white garments? And then what else are they clothed in? What else do they have on their head? They have golden crowns representing the victor crown. We talked about the victor crown already. Who has promised a victor crown in Revelation? We've seen it already in the letters to the seven churches. It's the church, isn't it? Those who overcome. And also, what did Jesus promise to the church that overcomes? He promised, you will reign with me in eternity. And so we have all three of those right here, don't we? If we believe 24 is a number of completion, we believe elders represent human beings, we believe white garments are prepared for the saved, those who are covered in the blood of Christ, we believe a crown is reserved for those who are victorious with Christ, and we believe that the words of Jesus when he says to his church, if you overcome, if you stay faithful to the end, whether you uh, get to the end of your life or I come back, you remain faithful to me. You don't give up and give out, but when the going gets tough, you stay faithful to me. You will have a place with me reigning in eternity. And so I think what John sees here, as he sees this open door, he gets brought into the throne room of God. The first thing he sees is God, and he is overtaken by the presence of God. And then I think he sees the raptured church around the throne of God. It's a place of authority. And let me tell you something. The only way you can make it to the throne room of God, by the way, whether you believe uh, the church is going to be raptured or not, uh, you believe in the blood of Jesus Christ, which means you're going to make it to heaven. Uh, the only way you can make it there and stand before Jesus is only by the authority of God. Good works don't cut it. Religion doesn't cut it. Morality doesn't cut it. Being a church member doesn't cut it if that's all that you are. Being baptized doesn't cut it if that's all that you are. Those are outward expressions of an inward change that has happened in your life. And it's only by the blood of Jesus that you can be in heaven experiencing all that John is going to experience. So do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your life is ready for that? If not, don't wait. Don't tarry. Heaven is a place of divine authority. But secondly, heaven is a place of distinct holiness. Look with me in verses 5 through 7. He says, Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the, uh, the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Verse 5, John sees his next image, and this is an image of power coming from the throne of God, that place of authority. And what John sees is like a thunderstorm uh, without the wind or the rain. He, he sees lightning and he hears thunder. When you and I see lightning and we hear thunder, we know a storm is near. We know things could get rough. But when John heard, uh, saw lightning and heard thunder in the throne room of God, he wasn't scared for uh, a natural occurrence. He was overtaken with respect because he realized the place of God is a commanding place. The place of God is a place of authority. And, and it, it baffles me how people think they can make it to heaven one day and stand before the presence of God and the throne of God all on their own. There is no way. Only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because the presence of God is so commanding. And by the way, it's the same presence of God that for those who don't know Christ, sadly will hear, depart from me for I never knew you. Because God gets to say that because he is the authority. 
And he says, and uh, there were seven lamps of fire before the throne, burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Uh, again, seven being a number of completion, talking about the Holy Spirit of God but around the throne of God. Because in heaven we see God in his complete nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're, they're separate, yet they are one. We cannot understand it completely with our human mind, but we believe it by faith because that is who God is. And then in verse 6, he says, Before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like a crystal, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures. There's this uh, experience of separation from the throne of God, like a sea of glass. And then John sees four living creatures. We're introduced to another set of characters. And these characters will give you nightmares. <laughs> He says, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion. Second creature like a calf. Third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. We know these are angelic beings. They represent cherubim. Cherubim is just plural for a cherub, an angel, an angelic being often referred to in Revelation as living creatures. They have full of eyes in front and behind. Not, and, and you don't need to take this so literal that you get uh, frightened over what you see here. Because these sound like creatures that might come up out of the abyss, but they're not. They're in the, they're in the presence of God. So there's nothing wrong with them. They're full of eyes in front, of, front and behind, showing that, that they are always aware in the presence of God of what is going on. That's why he sees them covered with eyes. It's symbolic for their awareness, their alertness in the presence of God. They know what's going on. And then he says, he gives us a description of them. We have a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a human. And these, uh, again, there's been difference of interpretation throughout the history of the church. Uh, but uh, somewhat the same, no matter how specifically one interprets this. That this just represents the whole of God's created order. If we were to look back and to study these four uh, animal-like creatures or, or humans and what they represented throughout the biblical story or the history of tradition, a uh, lion often represented untamed life. An ox represented domesticated animals. An eagle, flying creatures. And a human represents, obviously, human life. And so what John sees here are four angelic beings that are very alert, and they are alert... Uh, representing all of God's creation. Because what we know is that the angels, the Bible says the angels in heaven break out in praise when a lost person comes to faith. There are many times that the angels in heaven break out in praise. Well, how does an angel break out in praise when a lost person on earth comes to faith if they don't know, if they're not aware, if they're not alert? They definitely are. And so you realize that heaven gets loud when lost people come to know Jesus. And John sees part of this representation of all of God's created order. They're covered with eyes showing their alertness. Verse 8, he says, And the four living creatures, each of them had six wings and are full of eyes around and within. As he sees the throne room of God, he sees these 24 elders around the throne, and then he sees these angelic beings and look at what they do not cease to say holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and who is and who is to come heaven is a place of very purposeful distinct direct specific holiness God is holy. We've, we sang about it this morning. What we find here in Revelation 4, 8 is, can be likened to Isaiah 6. You remember when Isaiah got his call from God and he, he got a vision into heaven? And uh, he experienced the presence of God, the throne of God. And, and Isaiah describes these creatures. And Isaiah says they are before the throne saying, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He talks about their wings. Friends, if you don't believe the Bible is the 
fully inerrant word of God, I would love to hear a human explanation of how writing so far removed could come up with such specific details that still, still are the same. John wrote Revelation many, 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 many years after Isaiah. Isaiah got a picture into heaven and way back then the angels were doing what they were doing when John got a vision into heaven and they're still doing it. They are still before the throne of God saying holy, holy, holy. Holy. Why? Because heaven is a place of distinct holiness. When you and I get there, we're going to experience it. But as we live now, we must be getting a taste of it on earth. Heaven is a place only for the redeemed. There is no sin allowed in heaven. Only that which is either perfect or has been made perfect can enter heaven. God is perfect. And God's heavenly creation is perfect. God does not allow sin into heaven. Uh, Satan sinned, he had pride, he was cast from heaven, and he's been God's enemy ever since. God does not allow anything imperfect in heaven, including me and you. And so either only that which is perfect or has been made perfect can be in the presence of God. You and I fall in that has been made perfect. And we are made perfect not because of our church attendance or our Bible reading or our religion. We're made perfect only by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we get to be in the presence of God. We get to sing holy, holy, holy. We get to experience God's distinct holiness. But that day is coming, but God wants you to experience it today. God wants you to live in it today. He wants you to know today that by the blood of Jesus Christ, you can be made holy today. If you're saved, you are made holy today. Not that you are some special person set apart from everybody else, but you recognize that you are a sinner redeemed by the blood of Christ, and you just want to live your life to serve Jesus, and you can't wait to get to heaven to declare God's holiness to. Heaven is a place of distinct holiness. Lastly, heaven is a place of devout worship. These four living creatures declare holy, holy, holy. And verse 9 says, When the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, he's eternal, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne. There's another indication I believe this is the church. The Bible says that when we get to heaven, we have our white garments, we have our golden crowns, we have our, our eternal reward for being faithful to Jesus on this earth. But do you know when you get to heaven, it's, it's not going to matter to you to keep it. When you get to heaven and you experience what John is seeing right here in the presence of God, and these four living creatures are leading the heavenly worship choir, he says the 24 elders worship him who lived forever, and they they don't go over and quietly place their thrones before Jesus. I mean, their crowns before Jesus. Look at what he says. They cast, <laughs> cast their thrones before the crown. Uh, their crowns before the throne. You see, when you stand in the presence of Jesus, like Isaiah, we just might say, woe is me. How could I ever have made it here? But only by the blood of Jesus. And whatever we can receive, whatever we do receive, we cast it at the foot of the throne. And the 24 elders start singing, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created, even us. Heaven is a place of devout worship focused only on God. Pride is not allowed there and self-centeredness is not allowed there. That's why it's so destructive in the church. You know how Satan tears churches apart today? He tears churches apart today by pride and self-centeredness. What we do on earth needs to prepare us for heaven. Heaven is a place where worship is focused only on God. So when we come together as the body of Christ, we too need to focus only on, on God so that we can start preparing ourselves for eternity. 
get our eyes off ourselves, get our eyes on Jesus and on his throne, realize who he is, realize that he could come back today or we could stand in his presence today and experience this for all eternity. So let's start now. He is worthy. He should be our focus. You know, I think I said this a couple weeks ago, but we, we all say, have said, maybe still say at times, when I get to heaven, I can't wait to fill in the blank. What is that? What is it for you? I can't wait to see so-and-so. I can't wait to ask God so-and-so. I just want to remind us this morning that that's not really going to be the case. (laughs) You'll have eternity to ask God anything you want to ask Him. You'll have eternity to catch up with anybody you want to catch up with. and And I get it. I have loved ones in heaven that I can't wait to be reunited with. And some days this life, this life just gets too hard. And we say, well, Lord Jesus, could you just come back today? But let me tell you what's going to happen the moment you get to heaven. You're going to fall flat on your face before the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you're going to see those scars in his wrist and in his feet. And you're going to say, why me, Lord? How could I have ever made it here? I don't deserve this. I did so wrong in this life. I was such a sinner. And the blood of Jesus is going to mean more to you than it ever has in this life. But I want to ask you a really serious, important question today. Do you know that you're ready for that moment? Do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you're ready for that moment? John got a visit to heaven. And he wrote about it. He had to write about it. So that you and I could be prepared for it. But when you and I get a visit to heaven. There's going to be no more second chances. Either you're going to stand before the throne of God and everybody, everybody on the face of this earth will get a taste of the throne of God. It may not be an eternal one, it may be a brief one, but everybody's going to stand before the throne of God. And either you will stand before the throne of God completely covered by the blood of Christ and you will fall down and you will cast your crowns at the feet of Jesus and you will say, thank you, Lord, for all eternity. And you will get to experience all the wonderful, glorious aspects of heaven. Or else you will stand before the throne of God and you will have to give an answer for your sins because you didn't allow Jesus to be the answer for your sins. And any answer you give God will not measure up. And you will have to depart from Him to an eternity, still an eternity, but an eternity where the presence of God ceased to be. An eternity where goodness ceased to be. An eternity where evil always is. And it's a place called hell. Where the Bible says the fire never dies. We don't hear about that a lot anymore today. And I wonder why. Because it's still true and people are still going there. God doesn't wish that on anyone. But he wants all to come to repentance. That's why Jesus hung on the cross with his arms spread wide so that he could welcome anyone who would come to him. You see this little taste of heaven. There's so much more to it. But are you prepared for it? Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. Would you just prayerfully consider that question that I just asked? But you think about your heart and life and where you stand before the Lord. Are you prepared to stand before the throne of God? Are you prepared to meet Jesus face to face? If not, today all you have to do is trust Him. Surrender your life to Him. Tell Him that you're a sinner in need of His grace. You believe in His blood to make you right. And you want to live your life with Him as your Savior and your Lord. And he will save you. And then you must spend the rest of your days on this earth 
surrendering to him and worshiping him, preparing to do so for all eternity. I pray that God has spoken to you today as we have worshiped the Lord together. If He has laid a specific decision on your heart, whether it's following Christ for the first time or a a rededication uh, to the Lord or a prayer need, we take those very seriously. You will have some contact information there on your screen. Please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you in your journey with Christ.